Can a new Iranian nuclear deal be reached? What is the latest on the negotiations and what are the big issues still to be resolved? Hello, I'm Mike Walter and this is The Eat. After months of negotiation, the prospect of a revised Iran nuclear deal looked like it was close to the finish line. But will it ever happen? The initial agreement, also called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, was signed in 2015 between Iran, the United States, France, Germany, the UK, Russia, and China. The international accord collapsed in 2018 when then U.S. President Donald Trump abandoned it and imposed new sanctions on Iran. However, the Biden administration has made the revival of the deal an important priority, and Tehran is anxious to have sanctions lifted. Indirect negotiations between the sides have been taking place in Vienna, but the parties have failed to reach agreement, and just this week, the EU's chief diplomat, who has been facilitating the discussions, did not sound optimistic. So what I'm doing to keep consulting with all other GCPA participants and in particular the U.S., because it's a request that has to be fulfilled by the U.S. in particular, in particular, not the only one, and on how to proceed. But I'm sorry to say that uh, I am less confident today than 28 hours before. We have a great panel to discuss all of this. Joining us from Tehran is Mohammed Morandi. He is a chair of the American Studies Department at the University of Tehran. Also with us here in Washington is Daniel Surer. He is a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Joining the discussion from Oxford is Samuel Morani. Ramani, rather, he is an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. And from Beijing with us, too, is Einar Tangent. He is a senior fellow at the Taiha Institute. I want to welcome all of you to the show. Mohammed, let me start with you. Iran uh, definitely has these red lines, some sticking points that uh, it has to meet uh, in order to get a deal done. Uh, let's listen to the Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesperson. The closure of the international atomic energy probes is an absolute must to have a sustainable nuclear deal. So, Mohammed, talk to me about this sticking point in particular. Well, uh, a lot of accusations were made by the Israeli regime. And, of course, they are highly politicized, and the Israelis are by no means uh, a uh, standing member of the international community when they are, uh, regardless of the, the, the apartheid nature of the regime, but it's also uh, a regime that has nuclear weapons. So. Uh, when they make accusations against Iran and the International Atomic Energy Agency's Board of Governors opens an investigation, that is highly problematic for Iran, especially since the Board of Governors is not a technical body. It is a political body. They are representatives of different governments, and Western governments dominate the board for a host of different reasons. And the uh, IAEA chief is someone who is chosen by the United States. We saw that in the WikiLeaks documents when the previous chief uh, wanted to get voted in. He promised Americans that he would be with them on all major issues. This you can find online. So, uh, and also the current chief of the IAEA, he Literally, he, he traveled to Israel. There's, he traveled to and spoke with his Israeli regime officials immediately before the previous board of directors meeting. And that was uh, a highly uh, controversial act, because, especially since the regime has nuclear weapons. So uh, when the IAA, instead of behaving in, in a technical manner, it politicizes all the major issues then uh, with regards to Iran, then, then we're going to have a problem because if these issues are not resolved, if the, if the accusations uh, that are made against Iran, if these are not resolved, then the deal doesn't make sense because three months down the road, six months down the road, whenever the Americans get angry with Iran over something, they'll go back and uh, restart the investigation. And we have to recall that when South Korea was actually um, 
carrying out uh, practices that violated the NPT, the IAEA closed the case. Why? Because South Korea is a friend of the United States. Uh, there was no you know, out, global outcry. But with regards to Iran, even though Iran had the most intrusive uh, inspections in the world for years, we see that this case with regards to Iran on issues that go back over two decades ago right. are still being used in order to well, put pressure on Iran. Daniel, let me ask you about uh, uh, but what he just said. Uh, the IAEA seems to be a big sticking point for the United States as well. They want these inspections. Uh, and it seems like when you look at both sides, uh, the, the real crux of the problem is trust. Um, but talk to us about the IAEA inspections and the U.S. stance on this. I agree with Mohammed, actually, that this, uh, this investigation should be closed. But there are two ways of closing it. You can close it with a definite conclusion about why there were nuclear materials at an undeclared site. Or you can close it with some serious explanation of why there were uh, materials at that site. It, it seems to me that uh, Iran as an NPT member, Israel is not a non-proliferation treaty member, uh, Iran has obligations to explain uh, why this material was found, how it got there, what they were doing. What would, uh Samuel, let me ask you about Joseph Burrell, because, you know, we heard from him last month, I and mean, you were on the broadcast with us. He, he seemed like he was kind of hitting a positive note. Look, maybe, we may be close. This may be the final draft. Uh, this week, a, a lot more pessimistic about things. What's happened in the last month, and, and what's the view from Europe? Well, I think that it is a sign that there's been a number of developments that they view to be quite unfavorable. For example, from the European side, they would look at the Iranian enrichment, which was confirmed by the latest IEA estimates today, showing enrichment at 60 percent purity, which is like one tactical step away from what they believe to be weapons-grade levels. So there's a concern that Iran is continuing to enrich uranium and could very quickly reprocess that fuel into at least one nuclear bomb. So that's the probably biggest issue. And if there was European security services having intelligence about that or a tip-off on that before the IEA announced it today, that was very likely probably contributing to some of Burrell's rhetoric. Moreover, there seemed to be uh, a similar mood in the United States coming from Biden. Biden was uh, talking to Yair Lapid in Israel, and he was saying something very similar behind the scenes, that this deal is unlikely to be signed, not, not just now, but for the foreseeable future. That seems to be the assurances that the U.S. has given the Israelis. On top of that, you have uh, a bunch of other provocations that the West should be looking at. For example, the Iranian seizure of the U.S. drone operated by the RGC Navy in the Red Sea. The Red Sea is a strategically important area for Europe as well, particularly with the uh, uh, issues related to maritime security in the Horn of Africa, Indian Ocean in general. It's an Im important area. So a bunch of these uh, external provocations and just general uh, assessments of the Iranian uranium enrichment program probably contributed to his rhetoric. So, Mohammed, let me ask you uh, th this before we move on with the discussion. Wh what can Iran do in terms of providing some kind of assurances about enrichment, some of the issues that Samuel just brought up? Well, first of all, the American drone was uh, captured by the Iranian Navy, not the IRGC. And uh, the Americans are thousands of miles and thousands of kilometers away from their borders. The United States, which constantly threats Iran, threatens Iran with military action, should not expect Iran to be indifferent towards drones that uh, move across the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. Uh, and in other territorial waters near Iran. But um, I, what Daniel said actually is important about uh, the case needing to be closed. But the point is that, on the one hand, the Americans say that the Israelis are not a part of the NPT. But the IAEA chief went to Israel right before the Board of Governors meeting. That's, that's extraordinary. On the other hand, Iran is a member of the MPT, but if you, whatever Iran is enriching today is doing it within the framework of the regulations of the NPT. If the United States is so concerned about Iran's enrichment program, then the United States should accept a nuclear deal. 
The point is that the Iranians have given it, the IAA information about its nuclear program and about the questions that were raised. And these were, are questions about the infancy era of the Iranian nuclear program. The Iranian program today is highly developed. Back, the questions are, were raised about the time when Iran was beginning to produce or create the most uh, primitive type of um, enrichment capabilities. So it's obvious that back then there was no nuclear threat. They all, the Americans know that the centrifuges back then uh, were imported from Pakistan, and they know exactly why those, uh, uh, those centrifuges were uh, giving off radiation. But again, when it comes to Iran, there are double standards. If it's South Korea, the case is swiftly closed. When it's Iran, they'll keep it open because it's, it serves their purpose. They always want to have leverage over Iran. So the Iranians, as we speak, have said that we are, even, we are prepared today for Iranian uh, technical experts to sit down with IAEA technical experts. But at the end of the day, if the United States doesn't want the problem solved, the Board of Governors is not going to solve it. If the United States wants it solved, without a doubt, the IAEA, the IAEA chief will solve it. Uh, Andrew, one of the sticking points for Iran, obviously, is uh, what if there's a return to Trump or a like-minded uh, Republican comes into office and they just decide we're, we're, we're going to scuttle this deal as was done after the 2015 deal. Uh, came about. Uh, Trump, of course, walking away from it. You and I have had these discussions about the United States and kind of its commitments, uh, the Paris Climate Accords, and another one that they walked away from. It, this is a legitimate concern, isn't it? Absolutely, Mike. I mean, if, if you, you can't sign a deal that's never going to be completed, and uh, Biden's assurances that, look, it'll be good during my term, but, you know, who knows uh, thereafter, is not only uh, an issue for uh, Iran, but this is an issue for Europe, for everybody. I mean, you know, what what, what trust can you put in, uh, you know, a global superpower like the U.S. if it says, well, you know, treaties are just something that happen from administration to administration. And, Mohammed, talk to us about that, because Iran obviously would like something in the text. I mean, what might that look like? Well, one of the things that has been taken into account during these months of negotiations was that uh, the Iranians felt that both sides need to pay a price if they violate or leave the deal. Otherwise, the incentive to remain within the deal becomes very small, and that allows the United States to violate the deal and leave the deal. We have to remember that last time round, as pointed out, the United States left under Trump, but under Obama as well, the United States was systematically violating the deal, literally from day one, not from day two, from day one. They added new sanctions on the very day that the deal was signed, and things got went downhill after that. So what the Iranians have been negotiating was for assurances that, for example, during the period when the United States is a part of the deal, if foreign investors or foreign companies come to Iran, and then the Americans leave the deal after those foreign investors come and begin a project in Iran, those investors have to have some sort of security. The Americans resisted initially. They said it's, you know, it's not our problem. But then they had to, you know, they had to increase during the, the months of negotiations, they had to change their position on a number of occasions. And now it's, uh, it's I, I don't want to go into detail, but it's very different from what we saw on the table eight, nine months ago. Or for example, the issue of uh, containing sanctions. The United States says, for example, if Entity A is sanctioned, the Iranians are saying, well, if Entity A is sanctioned, then tomorrow you'll sanction B and C and D because they use the same banks and they use the same financial system. So they negotiated to make sure that the, 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 the sanctions can't spread. But in all these issues, the Americans have been stonewalling. They've been dragging their feet. They are trying to use vague lang language so that they can violate uh, the deal or, or to undermine the, um, the spirit of the deal in future. So whether it's sequencing or, or assurances, guarantees, uh, or the, the issue of the spreading of um, sanctions, all of these are, have major shortcomings. So the Iranians went after another issue as well, and that is what the Iranians call inherent guarantees. And in, in other words, the advances that the Iranians made over the last few years, they will preserve them. 
And so that if and but they will so the the new centrifuges will easily be assembled if the United States leaves the deal. So Iran can go back to normal enrichment. Why does Iran want that? Because they want to make sure that they have the capability to have the leverage to make sure the U.S. stays inside the deal. So in fact, all the things that the Iranians have negotiated after the, over the last few months are good for the deal. They're good for the Europeans. They're good for everyone because it creates an incentive for the Americans to stay within the deal. It wasn't, as I said before, it wasn't the Iranians that left. It was the Americans last time around. So, Daniel, uh, he's saying that uh, they've they actually strengthened the deal. The, the United States, States, though, still wary. What are, what are some of the sticking points on, on the U.S. side? Well, I think this uh, question of past undeclared, unaccounted for activities is important. But I, I have to add, I'm afraid, uh, I do it hesitantly, but I think it's true, that there is no domestic political upside for President Biden in reaching this deal right now. And I won't be surprised if it's delayed. There's an election coming in November, and uh, I just don't see any upside at all at this point uh, in rushing to complete this. Uh, now, don't expect the Americans to say they're not completing it because of uh, an upcoming election. but. Um, Show me the advisor who would say there was an upside uh, in, in completing this deal right now. Yeah, so domestic politics, obviously, uh, trumping foreign policy. So are, are we likely, Daniel, to see movement after November? I think movement after November is entirely possible, provided we don't see uh, a kind of explosion of Iranian nuclear activity uh, before then. I think uh, the Iranians should understand this problem for President Biden. Uh, the Americans should understand that there are comparable problems for Iran as well. Timing is important. And uh, I, I, I'm just not seeing this done before November. And Samuel, uh, after the JCPOA took effect, the New York Times uh, wrote, just as the ink was drawing on the text, uh, that European companies are moving quickly to invest in Iran. Uh, as they pointed out at the time, quote, with a population of 82 million people and substantial oil reserves, Iran represents a largely untapped market with the potential for fast growth. Um, is that still kind of the sense in Europe or, or now uh, would you say European country companies rather are, are a lot more wary after what happened uh, with the deal getting scuttled the last time around? Well, I think that there was at least some displays of interest from major European companies like you know, obviously Total Energy in France and many others who probably would have been keen to have invested in the uh, Iranian economy if it wasn't for the threat of American secondary sanctions first and then the, uh, the threat of the impending GCPA withdrawal, which happened in 2018. So there's certainly appetite in Europe to invest in Iran, but obviously it uh, remains unclear whether a GCPA negotiated agreement will be able to have enough assurances to uh, prevent or deter another U.S. withdrawal, because without those assurances, yeah, when the deal won't happen, or if the deal does happen, they probably won't be willing to go in. But given the situation where, that we're seeing, obviously, with Russia cutting off uh, Nord Stream supplies to Europe, we see Vladimir Putin today saying that Nord Stream is effectively stopped working, and the G7 oil price cap making uh, energy pressures on European countries even more pronounced. The Europeans have an economic incentive to want to get this deal started. There is a one half million uh, barrels a day that would be produced by Iran under the current baseline. If the deal is not extended or the deal doesn't come through, that'll fall to one million from 2023 to 2026. If the deal comes through, it'll increase to two and a half million. And that's a lot of extra supply that can enter the markets. Of course, Iran's pipeline infrastructure and Iran's transit infrastructure is heavily directed towards the east, right? It's directed towards China, it's directed towards India. It's not necessarily directed towards Europe, and that may not take an be an immediate fix. But in the long run, Iran could play a role in the divestment from Russian energy. So I think European companies will want to invest in Iran's energy sector, and European governments have an interest in making this deal go through. And I think that that could also play a part in either having the EU uh, make some more compromises than what they had in the original text to satisfy Iran, or, or the EU putting pressure on the Americans and Biden to move forward for the sake of a multilateral solution.
See, I mean, let me ask you this follow-up uh, based on what you just said. I mean, winter's fast approaching. Uh, November, obviously, is during winter time. The United States has this domestic issue. Uh, obviously, there's domestic issues in Europe as well. Uh, do you see European countries trying to apply some pressure on the United States to, hey, let's try and get something done? Because, uh, obviously, as you pointed out, the reliance on Russian energy uh, is going to be a big problem as winter approaches for European countries. Yeah, because of the fact that the Iranian pipeline infrastructure is not does not mean that oil transit from Iran to Europe is that easy in a large scale at this particular moment in time, as well as taking into account Iran's existing contracts uh, with uh, non-Western powers and their own domestic demand, there hasn't been that kind of groundswell of pressure. I mean, the European officials are still looking towards other suppliers to ameliorate their energy problems. They're looking towards Qatar, they're looking towards Algeria, they're looking even into sub-Saharan Africa whether looking at Senegal's offshore gas fields or they're now pursuing a free trade agreement with Angola, maybe there. So they're not necessarily looking to Iran right now just for this winter. But I think that the Europeans are thinking about this more as a long-term uh, contributor to their energy security and their future. And if the uh, Russia-Ukraine war goes on for a number of years, like many people predict, and sanctions against Russia continue, then this will be an important factor as we head into the next few years. Einer, let's talk about the future, but let's also talk about the past. 2015 doesn't seem that long ago, but it seems like a lifetime ago. When you look at the geopolitical landscape, uh, Iran's moving a lot closer towards Russia and China. Uh, we're, we're kind of people saying that there's these different blocks, Eastern Bloc, Western Bloc. I mean, from a geopolitical standpoint, uh, where has where the landscape shifted from 2015 to today? Well, definitely eastward. Uh, you start to see this kind of global south uh, coalescing, whether it's around BRICS or the SCO. Uh, you, see, you see these kind of alternatives to uh, the existing world order that has been talked about. But, you know, let, let's put the cards on the table. It's the worst kept secret in the world that, um, you know, Israel has uh, nuclear uh, capabilities, sometimes estimated at 50. Uh, you have a situation where the U.S. broke a deal and now is trying to figure out how to put the pieces back together that will not make it a political disaster. Iran has the same uh, issues. And the problem is you cannot have a resync. We do not have the kind of statesman or the ability to uh, sit down and talk about this. I, I heard this talk about, oh, well, you know, because of Russia, things will go towards Iran. I, I, I don't agree. I mean, Implicitly, uh, Europe is not necessarily going to trust Iran. There are still differences there. Uh, this is really about the nuclear uh, capabilities of Iran. So uh, mixing and matching these things when there is no trust, it's kind of pointless. Daniel, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about Israel kind of on the periphery. Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper because they're always the wild card in all of this. Uh, and, and they are opposed to a new deal. Let's listen to the Israeli prime minister and what he had to say. Together with Defense Minister Benny Gantz, alternate Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, and security officials, we are carrying out an intensive campaign, the goal of which is to prevent the signing of a dangerous nuclear agreement between Iran and the world's major powers. Talk to us about how Israel factors into all of this. Well, it obviously factors uh, because Israel has a good deal of influence in the United States, in particular in the U.S. Congress. I find the Israeli position uh, difficult to understand, to tell you the truth, because it seems to me that the original deal very much was in Israel's interest because it, it put a significant distance in time between Iran and having the fissionable material needed for a nuclear weapon. Whatever deal emerges now will probably uh, not be able to increase that time uh, to as much as it was in 2015, when it was said it was a year that, uh, that before uh, Iran could reach the nuclear threshold. As Mohammed has said, you know, things have advanced. The Iranians have more advanced centrifuges, and they're not going to be prepared to put as much uh, time in front of their nuclear capabilities. Uh, I find the Israeli position difficult to understand. I think it does have a great deal there, too, to deal to do with uh, domestic politics. I mean, Lapid is in a tough contest with Netanyahu, and Netanyahu was a, was a big hawk on Iran. Uh, but, you know, there's no accounting for taste. Uh, 
Uh, I find the Israeli position uh, a strange one, and I'm surprised that some of the Gulf states, like the Emirates and the Saudis, have essentially sided with Israel on this and opposed the nuclear deal, even though if war happens, they would be uh, in the target zone. Yeah, uh, Mohammed, let me talk to you about uh, Iran, because we've talked about Israel, uh, domestic politics there. We've talked about the U.S. domestic politics, uh, an election approaching in November. There's no upside to Biden doing a deal. But, but can you talk to us about public opinion there in Iran? Because there are those opposed to uh, entering into another deal with the United States and, and these other countries, the JCPOA, because of what happened uh, under the Trump administration. Yes, there are very differing views in Iran. They're hardcore supporters of the deal. Many, I think, are very irrational and hardcore opponents of the deal, many of them who I also think are irrational. I personally don't think it was a great deal or, or an awful deal. I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. But yes, these debates continue. Of course, now, uh, during the more recent negotiations, a lot of the problems that existed with the JCPOA were dealt with in the sense that an infrastructure was created to protect uh, Iran's rights, as I explained earlier on with regards to guarantees, sanctions, sequencing, and inherent guarantees, and that sort of thing. But ultimately, this debate is, is not going to go away. And when the United States stonewalls, or when the United States um, fails to um, move forward, I think they, they create further skepticism. It's obvious, in my opinion, that uh, the United States at the moment does not have the will to sign a deal because of internal uh, issues. And I think right now, th I think personally that the U.S. response to Iran, before Iran's, the, the latest Iranian response, indicated that it showed that the United States uh, was not ready for a deal. Now, whether the, a deal is possible before the U.S. elections or after the U U.S. elections or what, what the state of play will be in the coming days and weeks, I can't say for sure because things are happening so fast across the world uh, that uh, it's really difficult yeah. to d predict one well, week ahead. Yeah. But yes, in Iran, the, the, the debate goes on. Yeah, they, well, that's a good point. Prediction games, not well, a good I one to be add, involved I in. I should add one thing, and that is that not too many people care too much about the deal anymore because they've been negotiating for so long. And therefore, a lot of people ha have become indifferent. And uh, Iran is shifting away from Europe and the United States, largely because the United States and Europe have, have closed their doors to Iran. So as time goes by, Iran's reliance on Western countries will decrease. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Gentlemen, thanks so much. It's been a great, great discussion. And we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us for this edition of The Heat.